everybody and welcome to another incredible geo institute live stream if you are eagle-eyed and i think you are viewers you will notice that i have a very special background today because tomorrow is valentine's day and all of us at the geo institute wish you nothing but love please check out our social media feeds for geotech inspired valentines today and tomorrow We've got tons. They are full of sentiments that you will want to express to that special person in your life. Make sure that happens. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the GEO Institute. And again, we are thrilled to have you here today for, I believe this is the fourth annual, maybe only the third, partnership with you, Sugar, to bring you the National Science Foundation, your program directors to talk about agency priorities, updates to the proposal, and things coming down the pike for the agency and the rest of FY24 and in FY25. If you don't know anything about the GEO Institute, after you watch this today, head over to geoinstitute.org. There you will find out that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Of course, if you like what you see today, and I see absolutely no reason why you would not, you should click like, subscribe, get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. Now, of course, we mentioned this is a joint live stream with YouSugar, and so our host today is the current president of YouSugar from Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. It is Jack Montgomery, and he's going to tell you what you're going to hear now, tell you about his beads, tell you about you, sugar. <laughs> Jack, take it. Thanks, Brad. I really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, my name is Jack Montgomery. I'm an associate professor in geotechnical engineering at Auburn University and the current president of uh, U Sugar. So, I'm assuming if you're here, you know what U Sugar is. But for those who may have uh, stumbled in, we'd be happy to have you join us. We're the U.S. University's Council on Geotechnical Education and Research. Uh, we've got about 140 member universities spread across the country, and then we've got several great affiliates outside the U.S. and other uh, non-university institutions. Our mission is really to promote geotechnical education and research. And one of the things that I really love about USugar is the community it provides for other geotechnical faculty. So we connect uh, people through our email list. We try and host uh, workshops to bring young faculty into the group and uh, show them some of the things that we've learned. And we also help uh, share resources. And so we've got lots of great teaching resources on our website postings for academic positions, and we also offer small grants to fund often educational projects or to help support students traveling um, to conferences like the upcoming GEO Congress in Vancouver. So if you're not a member of USugar yet, you can head to our website, usucger.org. You'll see our membership link there and you're welcome to sign up your university. We're happy to have you join us. Uh, and then we will be meeting at GEO Congress in person for our annual meeting uh, Tuesday evening. So we really hope to see everyone there. So that's enough about you, Sugar. I'll introduce our two program directors that we're fortunate enough to have with us today. Um, so we have Dr. Giovanna Biscontin from uh, the Engineering for Civil Infrastructure program, and she is our geotechnical specialist within that program and uh, helps handle a lot of our geotechnical grants. And then we're also really fortunate to have uh, Dan Liang with us today too. And he is a program director with humans, disasters, and the built environment. And uh, Dan, if I saw it right, you're also a professor uh, just up the road from me at University of Alabama. So I'll greet you with a war eagle as well today. Um, so we're very, very fortunate to have both of these program directors here today. I'm going to turn it over to them and let them uh, tell us a little bit about NSF ways to approach NSF funding and about their individual programs. And then we'll have plenty of time at the end for uh, questions. So as you have questions during the, uh, the session, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll save those to the end and then we'll have some, uh, some great discussion too. So uh, Giovanna, Dan, thank you very much for joining us today and, uh, and please uh, take it away. 
Thank you. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction to both of you. Oops, I got out of uh, focus there. And I think we forgot one more event that is going on this week is Happy New Year. May you have a wonderful year of the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, a Chinese New perfect. Year, just, uh, just, right. uh, just about. So thank <laughs> you so much, Jack and Brad, for hosting us. We are looking forward to all the questions. Uh, we hope to get uh, a lot of uh, uh, interaction today. So we'll try to be quick and go through all the information, um, uh, you know, in the first part. I'm going to um, share my presentation so we can start with that, and here it is. Hopefully you can see that. Um, yes, all right. So as, as uh, um, uh, Jack mentioned, uh, there's two of us here today from Engineering for Civil Infrastructure and Human Disasters in the Built Environment. Um, what we hope to do uh, uh, introduce you to if you're not familiar to or give you uh, some additional information about the National Science Foundation and our programs and uh, highlight some of, some of the current uh, funding opportunities and solicitations. So the I always like to start with the, the numbers. I just downloaded the numbers for fiscal year 2023 that uh, uh, just ended. And I think the part that I want to, I usually highlight is, you know, that we review every year about 40,000 proposals and about 180,000 reviews are, were submitted in 2023. And so we thank everyone who contributed to this humongous amount of work through the year. And uh, we're looking forward to um, inviting you to panels. And we thank you again for the service. So, uh, a few more numbers uh, in there. Um, and I hope uh, that all of this is public information. So feel free to conduct, uh, consult our website. There's more. Uh, there as well. Um, the a quick overview of NSF. We have, uh, of course, Dr. Panchanathan is our director, but we have 10 uh, directorates and uh, some are more uh, focused on the administrative duties of NSF. And for example, if you receive a grant from NSF, it will come from the Office of uh, Budget Finance and Award Management, which is uh, our branch that deals with all of those uh, um, important tasks. Uh, most of the other directorates are uh, related to the subject matter. Uh, both uh, Dan and I are in the Directorate of Engineering, uh, which is uh, again, subdivided further into um, different uh, divisions. We belong in the Civil, Mechanical and Manufacturing Innovation Division. Um, we also have uh, the Chemical and Bioengineering Environmental Transportation System, Transport System, not Transportation, <laughs> and Electrical Communication and Cyber System. The Engineering Education and Center is uh, um, a little bit more across uh, in terms of topics, and it's uh, um, about uh, big centers and uh, uh, STEM education as well. So in CMMI, there are a lot of boxes, but we essentially have five um, different clusters. We call those uh, the group of different subjects. And uh, myself, I'm in the engineer for civil infrastructure cluster, where we also uh, look after the natural hazard engineering research infrastructure, or NARI. Whereas Dan is in the operations and design cluster, you can find him here in, uh, in right in the middle of a slide. <laughs> we have a lot of other different uh, uh, programs uh, and we call those core programs. Um, anything that has that light blue color is uh, considered a pro core program and will have no proposal deadline. So you can submit unsolicited proposals anytime. All right, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit uh, about the Engineering for Civil Infrastructure cluster. There are three program directors, myself, Joy Poshki, and Gianluca Kuzatis. I look after all the coastal engineering and geotechnical engineering proposals and awards, whereas Joy uh, looks after the NARI 
uh, infrastructure and the uh, structural engineering proposals related to hazard, natural hazards in general. And John Luca uh, uh, instead looks after infrastructure materials and stru structures, uh, but not related to hazards. So um, ECI focus areas are geotechnical engineering, structural engineering, infrastructure or geomaterials, architectural engineering, coastal engineering. We look uh, uh, for a proposal related uh, to the behavior of civil infrastructure in the natural environment, both during construction and during service and long-term conditions, long, severe loading or extreme multiple event, extreme single and multiple hazard events. We are particularly interested in proposals and research that focuses on climate change mitigation and adaptation to reduce the civil infrastructure carbon footprint, address adaptation strategies uh, for resilience and promoting uh, equitable and quality of life. We receive proposals that are both disciplinary and cross-disciplinary. We'll tell you a little bit more about that, I think. We have a special initiative on that uh, side. Um, single PI, multiple PI and teams. Uh, particular focus is uh, uh, on contribution to the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program and the National Windstorm Impact Reduction Program. And of course, uh, we appreciate uh, leveraging the NARI network, both the experiment, not both, but the experimental facilities and uh, the computational resources and also the cyber infrastructure. All right, um, some, some don'ts. We uh, do not support uh, research that lacks grounding in theory that is not fundamental and research that is not focused on civil infrastructure. And we have a little bit of a list. Um, because some, since sometimes the uh, boundaries between what could be supporting, what maybe isn't appropriate for submission to ECI are sometimes uh, difficult to uh, figure out, we really encourage everyone to contact us and uh, describe your research idea in a perhaps a one page uh, short summary, and that will allow us to either ask questions or give guidance uh, in terms of uh, suitability for the program. I just put in one slide on NARI. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with the, the natural uh, hazard infrastructure, research infrastructure. If not, I encourage you to um, consult their website, but NARI is essentially a network of facilities that are supported uh, by NSF in order for you to perform your research uh, um, in, in, in the facilities. Um, there are a number of different ones. I'm going to highlight the geotechnical ones, uh, you know, the mobile shakers, the field mobile shakers at the University of Texas, Austin, the geotechnical centrifuges at UC Davis, and potentially the um, large uh, shake table at the University of California, San Diego. There are um, wave flumes in Oregon, um, the rapid facility for uh, reconnaissance uh, gets uh, a, a lot of use. And then there are facilities um, in Florida for uh, wind simulation, the hybrid simulation and uh, testing facility at Lehigh, computational facilities at uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, the cyber infrastructure again at uh, UT Austin. The coordination is at Purdue, and we also have uh, uh, one of the uh, facility is Converge, which is uh, um, a social science and interdisciplinary, um, offers social science and disciplinary resources. We have two satellites here at the bottom. Those are facilities that are coming potentially down the line. Um, the niche facility is about, uh, oops, sorry it's going want to go to the website, is uh, about um, testing with the uh, integrated wind, wave, and surge. Um, it's in the design stage, and uh, the new right facility is super new. So again, this is in the 
uh, conceptual stage. So stay tuned and we'll see uh, how those evolve. I would encourage you to consult the science plan that's uh, quite new, just a few months old. And uh, a reminder that new, new things are coming for NARI because all the awards uh, are set to uh, end at the end of next year. Dan, would you like to <laughs> continue? Sure. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Uh, my name is Dan Liao. I'm the program director for Human Disasters and Build Environment Program. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So my program uh, has a lot of uh, synergy with uh, the ECI. Uh, uh, first of all, we all concerned with uh, disasters and infrastructure, so that uh, is quite obvious. And also, uh, we all leverage the narrow facilities, especially the design safe or uh, data. Uh, archival and publishing and also convergence uh, that where uh, we combine the uh, engineers with a so social science. Uh, so really my focus of my program is to look at uh, fundamental understanding of oops, fundamental understanding of the humans and build environment uh, in the context of disasters. So in that sense, as human could be individuals, uh, household, businesses, organizations, or even the government. Uh, and built environment can also be um, individual buildings or could be infrastructures uh, at a different scale. So, but what we are really trying to understand is how human behaves uh, in, uh, in relationship to the infrastructures when there's a disaster or uh, in anticipation to uh, disasters. Uh, the um, we're looking for proposals that will uh, deepen our understanding and uh, explore uh, such interactions. Uh, the type of the effort can be focused on uh, creating new theories or creating new methodologies. Uh, in recent years, we also place more uh, uh, emphasis on the new data set. Um, so that's hopefully I can give you a few examples later on. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so here uh, we really support uh, the research uh, committees through different uh, funding mechanisms. Uh, the uh, the one I want to start with is the record. That's when there's a, a major disaster and the researchers like to uh, deploy and uh, collect some data. Uh, before they despair. So we oftentimes uh, either support the rapid uh, by ourselves or oftentimes work with other programs like uh, ECI and definitely take advantage of the rapid facility as part of the NARI. Uh, as, as a core program, we uh, accept career proposals. Uh, so we have some uh, example of the recent uh, career uh, award uh, given by HDBE. Uh, because of the um, interdisciplinary nature of the HDBE, oftentimes for the unsolicited proposals, uh, typically are proposed by a team of, uh, of uh, uh, engineers with working with a social scientist. So that's why oftentimes uh, we will accept collaborative proposals, uh, bring in different expertise, either from a single, uh, sometimes from multiple institutions, uh, and oftentimes, uh, if there is a need that we need to uh, investigate uh, that will inform our future investment, we'll start with uh, sponsoring a conference. Uh, we, uh, uh, last September, uh, we supported uh, a US-UK workshop on uh, urban underground infrastructures, and now uh, we are reading uh, their report and see uh, how is that going to help us to uh, decide on the uh, the future of uh, several programs within our division. And also the other thing worth noting is that disaster uh, happens across the goal and sometimes even across the um, the boundaries of uh, certain countries. So that's why uh, last year we uh, worked with uh, our Japanese counterpart uh, to uh, issue a dear colleague letter on 
advancing the human center disaster data for disaster resiliency. Uh, so we uh, are in the process of uh, making uh, several awards uh, as a result of that uh, DCL. Uh, next slide, or go back to Giovanna. Thank you. So just a, a quick overview of funding mechanisms. The typical proposal that um, you would send to NSF is an unsolicited award that goes directly to the um, core programs. Um, we also, uh, hopefully everybody's familiar with the career uh, program. I have a slide later on, and Dan has already highlighted some of these. Uh, a conference uh, proposal is typically a workshop proposal, but NSF calls it a conference, and then the rapid response research, uh, the uh, rapids. Um, if you have a an NSF grant, you should um, consider the various uh, uh, possibilities for supplements to existing grants. And I think I have another slide on that, so I'll get a little bit more into the detail. And I made a long list of various potential uh, solicitations that we have, but I'll go more into detail. So if you have a grant, the most typical uh, of the supplements that NSF uh, um, is actually happy to give you is the research experience for undergraduates. So um, that is additional funding on top of your grant to um, work with undergraduate students uh, on research. It's uh, uh, a grant for $8,000 per student and you can have uh, up to two students. And it's also a, a, the other opportunity is the research experience for teachers where there's a little bit more um, on that. Oops, I don't know the last one. <laughs> I apologize, that one is not about, we're not gonna give you 70K for students. So I don't know where that <laughs> kind of, uh, uh, or for teachers. So please uh, um, disregard the last line. I don't know how that happened. Right now, the big one is the geothermal intern. So if you have a grant and you think you can, you and you have some way um, of uh, conducting research, uh, on geothermal energy um, with the, in collaboration with a company with an intern program, meaning that you could send your PhD students to work at the company for six months. Um, that is a really um, great opportunity available now. And then there's the regular intern uh, uh, program. Again, for students uh, to sponsor students for up to six months to work in a non-academic settings. Um, the career life balance is to support uh, academics uh, with salary and other um, support for somebody to um, help them in their labs the, uh, uh, during uh, periods of uh, um, family leave. So Dan already discussed the rapid response research or rapid proposals. Um, these are generally for to react to uh, unexpected events. So uh, generally they're very they're small grants and uh, uh, they really should focus on these three bold uh, black bold bullets, perishable data collections um, and contribution to advance the basic knowledge. You cannot submit a rapid proposal unless you already have an email from a program director uh, allowing you to submit. So there's no direct submission. You need to submit a concept outline first and get approval from a program director. Same type of uh, uh, process for eager proposals. These are, uh, again, relatively small grants for exploratory work in early stages on untested but potentially transformative research ideas and approaches. These have to be high risk and high reward um, because they involve radically different approaches and are novel and uh, interdisciplinary, for example. Again, if you um, are wondering whether this is a possibility, you should submit a concept outline. I will be fully honest, we don't, at least in ECI, we don't often uh, give uh, um, eager awards, so um, please contact us, uh, but don't get too excited <laughs> about this. 
Um, you can find more information on the PAPG, uh, the Policy and award Awards and Procedures Guide. Um, uh, sorry, Policy and Award Policy. I can't even remember what that is. <laughs> It's too long. Uh, proposal in awards procedure guides, uh, and uh, it's basically the manual for NSF. Any question, the, the answer is in there. It may not be perfectly clear. We also have, so you can submit all of those proposals, unsolicited proposal, rapid or eager conference at any time, often with a concept outline before. Um, but we also have solicitation. A solicitation is usually issued with a separate document and a specific deadline. We have, so I wanted to highlight the investing in new funding opportunities. So for early career faculty, we have the career program, uh, which is uh, well known. And we also have an engineering research initiation. Anything that is gray in this slide is something where the next deadline has not been issued. So I don't know if there's going to be a new deadline for some of these programs. For mid-career faculty, um, CMMI has issued before the uh, bright solicitation on boosting research ideas for transformative and equitable advances in engineering. And uh, again, we don't have uh, a, a deadline for that. Engineering-wide, the Trailblazer Engineering Pact Award um, is also for mid-career faculty. The deadline, I think, for the letters of intent was uh, last month. So um, have a look and see what the new uh, if a new solicitation is issued. The career program supports early career faculty uh, to serve uh, as role models in research and education, and they need to integrate uh, teaching, learning, and discovery. It's a big grant. It's five years, a minimum of $500,000, and I'm sure everybody knows the deadline is the third week of July. This year will be 24 July. Uh, and uh, you know, it's it's one of our favorite programs. We're always uh, very delighted to uh, give uh, career awards. So if you have any questions, please let us know. The ERI, again, we don't have a deadline, but it's for uh, new investigators that have not received any funding from federal agencies. And also the uh, uh, principal investigator is not affiliated with a very high research activity uh, institution or R1 institution according to Carnegie classification. So keep an eye out for this one because it, it's a it's a nice program. Um, I want to highlight the fact that there's a solicitation that specifically addresses primarily undergraduate institutions, especially through um, uh, both the, uh, kind of collaborative proposals, for example, or uh, uh, collaborations uh, uh, between faculty uh, as the supplements. I want to spend uh, a few words on a dear colleague letter. A dear colleague letter is in a way similar to a solicitation, but it's basically highlighting um, areas of research, for example, that uh, a particular program or um, or directorate uh, uh, would like to support and, in, and uh, encourage research on. So uh, many programs in CMMI have banded together to issue this Dear Colleague Letter on Civil Infrastructure Research for Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation. We call it CLIMA. We had a first round of the award um, late this summer and we're still accepting proposals, so we encourage you to consider this opportunity. Its uh, main requirements uh, are that the research needs to be uh, interdisciplinary, and it needs to uh, essentially span uh, the areas of more the, of two or more uh, CMMI programs. I made a list. It's a word salad, but essentially, you know, it could be ECI and HDB. You will need to submit a concept outlet again. We would assess whether we think that indeed that research is interdisciplinary, so would be relevant to the two programs that you suggest and you select. And if um, 
uh, that is the case, you'll be invited to submit a full proposal. So please um, consider the Klima solicitation, dear colleague letter, and uh, um, send a letter to klima at nsf.gov if you have any questions. Dan, would you like to talk about smart, smart and connected communities? <laughs> sure. So, uh, yeah, this is through my uh, core program, HDBE. I'm also part of the working group managing uh, what we call the cross cutting uh, solicitations. So, this is uh, SEC is one of those uh, solicitations I'm heavily involved with. And especially for this audience, there's a good opportunity for you to consider if your research really has a strong committee engagement uh, component to it. Uh, so we SEC can uh, support the planning grant, which is up to 150K for one year. And if you are uh, look at the research, they have two tracks. So one is uh, 2.5 maximum, the other is 1.5. So, so definitely uh, the SEC will give you uh, more resources allow you to, you know, form a bigger team and go after some uh, community identified uh, big challenges. Um, the uh, we also don't have deadlines for SEC, so you can submit any time. But somebody asked me the current solicitation end uh, sometime in April, but we are working actively to issue a new solicitation. So definitely. This program will stay, is not going to go away. And also, I want to point you to uh, a website called uh, sccvo.org, and that's where uh, you can find all the uh, previous work. And also, uh, we're going to have a PI meeting uh, in late uh, February uh, in conflict with the uh, Geo Congress. That's why I couldn't go to Geo Congress. Um, and but definitely, uh, if that's some something you are interested in, uh, I highly encourage you to check out the, uh, the website. Uh, next slide. Uh, as I said before, you know uh, we are really looking for innovative solutions to uh, committee uh, priorities. So in the past, actually we have supported uh, a project that led by. Uh, a geotechnical engineers, so uh, either in the planning uh, track or in actually the uh, integrated research track. So you probably are recognizing some of the names uh, on these slides, and uh, and definitely uh, encourage you to uh, check out their project and talk to them or talk to me. That's all welcome. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the, the other solicitation kind of uh, we call it the. A sister program to SEC is called Civic Innovation Challenge. That's where uh, you're giving a very short uh, project period to pilot a solution in a real uh, committee based environment. Uh, so the award size is $1 million, the project is 12 months in duration. So that means you are ready to hit the ground running on day one and finish and give us the. Uh, the uh, the report back uh, within 12 months. So this is a collaboration between the NSF and uh, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, and USDA. And in the current solicitation, we have two tracks. One uh, mainly look at uh, the committee's response or preparation for climate change and natural disasters. And the other is look at how to narrow uh, the gap between the uh, uh, infrastructures and resources and the uh, the need of the communities. Um, and new, new solicitation just has been released and we have a deadline for the planning proposal. So you have to go through two stages. So the first one is planning and uh, that's the due date is May 1st. And then, uh, uh, then the ones who have received the planning proposal uh, qualified for submitting the stage two uh, proposal to the Civic Innovation Challenge. Next slide. Uh, again, uh, here I just listed a few projects we have awarded in the past. So we already done uh, two rounds of competition. So now we're in what we call Civic 3.0. 
So you definitely can uh, go to the uh, Civic Innovation Challenge website uh, again to check out what has been supported, uh, who are the PIs, and what kind of issues uh, they are addressing. And uh, again, uh, there's a good opportunity to consider if you are at the stage that you're ready to uh, to pilot your ideas in uh, in a real community. Uh, next slide. I'll go back to you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to very quickly go through the last few slides. This is uh, uh, another solicitation, and it only comes about every two years. So we have a deadline this year. It's a uh, leap high. This could be interesting for um, this community. It's uh, these are bigger proposals, one to two millions, up to five years, and they will require um, kind of a, a team addressing a. Uh, multidisciplinary topic that has a, a significant societal impact. Oh, I don't know why that was there. I wanted to highlight that since 2022, we have a new director for technology, innovation and partnership tip, and they have a number of opportunities. Uh, their program is still ramping up and we're all still learning about uh, what they're offering, but I would encourage you to learn more and venture over onto their website to figure out what is available uh, through them. The um, top one, I think, responsible design, development, and deployment of technologies. It's, uh, it has a track that is uh, relevant for um, disaster and re resilience, I believe. So this is just out uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, again, uh, strong encouragement to consider some of these other offerings from TIP are like big, big projects with big, big teams, but um, especially um, could be especially interesting for uh, our engineering uh, colleagues. So a few service announcements. Uh, here it is, the Proposal and Award Policies and Procedure Guide, the PAPG, <laughs> um, is coming, is changing. The new effective date will be uh, May 20. So anything that's submitted uh, on May 20 or afterwards will need to actually uh, comply with the new PAPG. Big change here is that the mentoring plan, which uh, up to now uh, was required for postdocs, now uh, graduate students need to be included as well. Changes to the biosketch started last year, so now submission with sci, science, and CV is required, but there are no length limitations anymore, or there will be. Um, more question, more guidance on concept outlines, and then a few more items. I'm going to highlight the uh, certification required for off-campus and off-site research, because a lot of the proposals we receive have some kind of field investigation, and you'll, you'll have to um, make sure that that uh, um, uh, certification is uh, um, ready to go for off-campus and off-site research. So if you have questions on whether your idea would fit a program at NSF, the best way to find out is to contact the program directors. It's always helpful to have a one-page project summary that allows us to kind of give get a first sense of what you want to do and, and start asking questions. Um, so highly encouraged. Um, it, you're always encouraged to volunteer as a, as a reviewer. We are always looking for more panelists. So um, please, if you um, would like to be a reviewer, send us uh, uh, a CV um, and uh, um, we'll put it in our list. So uh, expertise highlights are always helpful. So not just the CV, tell us what you're, you know, five bullet points of what things you believe that you would be interested in reviewing. A few links to how the marriage review process works and uh, orientation videos. If you have not been part of an NSF panel, those are kind of interesting to watch.
Finally, if you would like to know to be up to date with new solicitation and funding opportunities, go to the NSF website, scroll all the way to the bottom and sign up for email updates. So you can then select which uh, emails you would like to receive from which directorates and, and so on. You can tailor the information just for you. And I think that is almost the last slide. Dan, unfortunately, will not be able to come to Geo Congress because he has a big meeting right on the same date. Um, but I will be at Geo Congress and I'll be happy to meet with as many people as I can <laughs> over there. Um, if you'd like to set up an appointment, I would encourage you to um, send me an email and please put Geo Congress meeting in the um, subject so that I know what that is. I will give priority to early career academics and uh, you know just keep in mind if we don't get a chance to meet and speak um, you can always email me and, I, and we can have a virtual meeting on Zoom. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, both Giovanna and Dan, for, for doing that. I think it's a really great summary of information. I did want to uh, um, hit a couple of things. So this is being recorded and will be uh, archived to YouTube right afterwards. So if there was something in Giovanna's presentation or Dan's part there that you missed, you can go back and check that. I also received a question from my friend of why am I wearing necklaces today? So I did uh, <laughs> want to say for those who are outside of the southern United States, it is Mardi Gras and everyone is welcome to celebrate today. Um, so with that, uh, I wanted to get to some of the questions. If our audience has questions, please put those in the chat and those will be sent over to us. Um, to kind of get started with this, um, Giovanni, you talked a bit about reviewers, and I know that's one of the big ways that the community can be involved in this process. You talked about sending the CV and kind of the expertise um, as a way to get signed up to be a reviewer. Um, I, I do remember that one part is you can't be a reviewer if you have a proposal pending, Correct. right? Now, yeah. it's a little bit trickier because it's a, you cannot be a reviewer in a certain panel um, if you have a proposal submitted to kind of the same panel. So if you have an unsolicited proposal uh, submitted to ECI or HDB, you cannot be in an unsolicited uh, ECI or HDB panel, but you could be on a panel that is uh, assessing civic proposals or, um, you know, whatever it is, something else. So, it, you know, we try to check, but if you get a, um, a an invitation, a tentative invitation, you know, are you available and you are not sure, just let us know and we can check. It's always better to make sure first, uh, you know, <laughs> than to find out, um, <laughs> especially in the middle of the panel. <laughs> yeah, of course, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, and you know, when when people are thinking of being a reviewer for NSF, um, do uh, do either of you have some some tips? I know we have kind of the the guidelines for good reviewing, but kind of the approach that reviewers can take, and maybe how they can be kind of the strongest reviewer for the program. Absolutely. I'll give you, you know, my view and then Dan can also uh, help me here if I forget anything. Um, I think there's a there's a, a few things. Of course, uh, um, we uh, we would like substantive reviews. Um, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's important to um, really explain um, what is the, the novelty and the exciting component. I know that I, I always try in panels to um, tell people to focus on what is exciting about a proposal. You know, what is it that is like the key idea that makes that particular proposal, um, you know, something that stands out that, you know, we would we should really uh, try to fund. And that you know, op keep keep somewhat of an optimistic view because you know, <laughs> academics tend to um, love to find all kinds of little things and big things sometimes. You know, not all the proposals are are ready for prime time, but um, I think uh, focusing first on is the idea exciting and why is it is a is a good way 
and then substantive reviews. Dan? Sure. Uh, what I totally agree what uh, Joanna just said. Uh, only thing I want to add is that uh, uh, oftentimes we ask you to write uh, written reviews, but also in most of the uh, cases, we also uh, invite you to the panel discussion. So uh, when, when you come to the panel, feel free to express your opinions and evaluation of the proposal, but also at the same time, you know, listen to the other panelists and try to, at the end of the day, we are hoping that the panel can come up with some sort of uh, consensus that we can use uh, in uh, informing our decisions. Sometimes, in most cases, uh, we can't reach that point. Sometimes we can't, but that's that's the really the value of having a, a in-depth discussion about the merits of uh, those proposals. Great, yeah. Thank you both for that. I think um, definitely strongly recommend everyone volunteer to be a reviewer. It's a really great experience to serve on those those panels. Um, we talked about the concept outlines and kind of the the one page white paper as that's a mm -hmm. kind of an important part to to figuring out the right place to send your proposal and also making sure that that you've kind of got the the main pieces down. Do you have some suggestions as people are working on that? Maybe things you see that you really wish you didn't see as often or uh, for those yeah. one pagers, what should people be thinking about as they prepare those? Okay, so I want to draw a distinction a little bit. Um, there's kind of an informal pinging of the program director. So if you're kind of thinking about an idea, it's a lot better if you can put something on uh, some text together because it, it just it's just easier for us to to think about it and and have some thoughts beforehand so I would highly recommend you know write something you know it doesn't if it's just a, like informal then it doesn't need to be one page it doesn't you know there's a little bit of a more relaxed uh, you know format don't send me the I'd say don't send me five pages because I'm you know <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, our job isn't to to assess whether this is a good proposal. Our says our job is at that point is to say yes, it fits. No, it doesn't. And you know, the the most common question usually is, can you highlight the novelty of the intellectual merit? You know, because that's one of the big elements. So. Um, again, if it's an informal communication and you're trying to develop your idea and you would like to kind of sound us out, that's great. There's also the formal concept outline. In order to submit certain proposals, you cannot submit directly to NSF. So an unsolicited proposal, go ahead. I mean, it's good to check with the program director if that's a, it's a good fit because you don't want it to be returned without mm. review. Um, so don't do all the work unless you know. <laughs> but for an eager proposal, for a rapid proposal, for a num for the clima, for the clima uh, DCL, um, many of those require a concept outline, and that's a, kind of a new concept on the uh, latest uh, last couple of PAPG, where you of, you know formally need to send a one page or I can't remember if it's one or two, but you know there are specific guidelines on that okay we at this point i mean i kind of want to say i didn't say this but um you didn't hear it from me <laughs> it's better if you even if it's a formal request send it by email because um that prospect has been a bit tricky so it's it's a lot faster if you send a, an email directly and and uh, um, about potentially submitting a rapid or an eager uh Perfect. Yeah, one Good. thing I want to, yes, one thing I want to add is, you know, sometimes if we look at your one pager and feel it's not a good fit with our own program, but oftentimes we can give you some suggestions on where you could go uh, within the SF. People oftentimes I will tell you it's not good fit with HDBE, but seem to be, you know, why don't you talk to or consider you know, SEC, why don't you consider, you know, civil infrastructure systems? Because each program have their own priorities or portfolios and, you know, the things they want to 
emphasize. So that if it doesn't fit with my program, doesn't mean it cannot find a home within a foundation. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, thinking of people who, who've been fortunate to, to get the award and they're looking at the supplements. Um, so thinking about the REU supplement, we did have a question of kind of when can that be used? So um, is that you, you can apply once a year, does all that money have to be used within a certain part of the calendar year or within 12 months of any of that? How does that work? Neither. Okay. So um, I think that lasts until the end of your uh, award. Great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, I know. Clearly. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to say, clearly, you're submitting an annual report, though. So it would be good. <laughs> it would be expected that that annual report actually says what you did with that supplement. And before the new supplement is requested. <laughs> so I'm just going to say, You're yeah, not looking to the, stack these up on the, yeah. <laughs> the money. And, and keep in mind, it's money. So the budget for an RU is very specific. All those 8,000 K, 8,000 K? If you wish, huh? That'd be nice. <laughs> eight billion would be a, eight million would be quite a bit. Um, they the eight thousand um, going participant support costs, which is a very special category. So there there are restrictions on what you can do with those funds, and there are restrictions on well, you can't use them for anything else. Just to, right. you know, right. Straight FYI. <laughs> and I know um, from previous conversations, Giovanna, if somebody's looking at having a student for the summer, uh, mm -hmm. when should they be talking to you about uh, the REU, just to kind of give people some some guidelines? Great. Yes. So the CMMI has guidelines on when we prefer to accept REU proposals. So if you just Google CMMI REU you know, I'll, I'll, that's what I do. So it'll get, land you on the right page. <laughs> um, but essentially, we um, ask that you submit your RU request between October 1st and uh, um, end of April. And it's purely for practical reasons. Um, you know, after April, the fun starts to dwindle. So you <laughs> don't want to ask. And then it becomes an issue of uh, processing. So you you want to be early enough that we can process that award and keep in mind it always takes you know at the very minimum four to six weeks for anything to go through the process of being awarded. So you know that means that you know we can't if you want it in the summer <laughs> you know it needs to be a, a few months before the summer at the very least. And then if you submit it in June, we probably can't awarded until it's possible that it won't be awarded before the next of the following October. So just right. be careful. Um, for the the geothermal intern supplement, um, is that uh, only limited to PIs supported by ECI or if they have a grant from another program? No, is that mm -mm. something they'd be eligible? No, 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 no. I think it's NSF wide. I mean, I don't I, I please you know, Google uh, geothermal intern supplement just to for 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 making sure. Um, but it, I think reasonably, uh, you know, for um, grants and all NSF grants. I'm sure it's anything that comes out of the geo directorate um, and engineering would be fine. Um, Definitely but, not just ECI. Definitely not just ECI. If you have questions. Um, you know, look it up. If you still have questions, send me an email. Okay, perfect. Um, and uh, uh, just a reminder, go ahead and put those questions in the chat. Sorry about the motorcycle driving by if that came through. Put those questions if in the chat if you have them. Um, you know, one question that I had, uh, you've both uh, looked at this uh, from both sides now to quote uh, Joni Mitchell. Um, do you have some some things that you've learned being at NSF that you wish as maybe an, an early career faculty member uh, you had known? Um, obviously, we don't have a ton of time left, but if you have uh, some of those things that have occurred to you during your time, I'm sure people would love to hear that. Uh, I'll let can, Dan answer. Yeah, I can go <laughs> first. And uh, I think two things I, I wish I 
I knew when I was a junior faculty starting up. Well, number one is don't be afraid of contacting the program directors because uh, you know we're all here to support you, and many of us, you know, just uh, come from academia and then you know either join the SF or stay with the SF for a number of years. So, so definitely you're talking to a colleague, but instead of you know treating us as uh, anyone different, right? So, you know, any ideas, feel free to, you know, share with us. And if you run, uh, run into us during the conferences, yeah, let's have a conversation. So, uh, so that's the number one. Number two is that uh, sometimes I wish I could understand how broad the SF is. Sometimes I'm so focused on my own program, right? But then, as I pointed out in this presentation, if you are really interested in research related to disasters, there's plenty of opportunities, right? Coming to the core program, going to different programs, go to programs that supporting the translation from research to practices. So it just, uh, or, you know, doing something overseas, you know, working with other uh, foreign uh, researchers. So there's a, Really, uh, many, many opportunities to support uh, novel ideas and uh, create uh, creative solutions. And sometimes uh, you don't have to solely focus on a single program. So those are the two things I, I wish uh, I, I knew when I was uh, assistant professor. I'll I'll add something that maybe it's not something it's not something that I learn as a as as a program director, but something that I learn as an early career faculty. And uh, uh, you know, I just want to encourage everybody to really learn how to write an NSF proposal because, it, and that's why you know reviewing is is good. But um, it really took me for sure. Uh, some time to learn how to really um, lay out my ideas in a way that was uh, consistent with the expectation of a panel. You know, when they tell us, uh, um, you know, lacks details, what did they mean? Well, you know, it's like now, you know, I've seen it hundreds of times. So sometimes I want to, you know, I, I translate <laughs> to to faculty <laughs> what that particular, you know, sentence means, I would just encourage uh, um, early career faculty to um, really fo spend some time uh, figuring out what the expectations are in terms of what a proposal looks like and sounds like, because there, there's really, it's not that it needs to be, you know, all of them are the same, but there's kind of like a rhythm to them. Then there's some kind of like expectation to what is in it and um, that it really is uh, important. And also to um, really make it easy for reviewers. You know, it's when you're a reviewer, you realize how much effort goes into assessing a proposal and making it hard is really not going to win any brownie points for your proposal. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, just just I always encourage people to to grab, you know, somebody they really trust and really cares about them and ask them to read the proposal, even if they know nothing about it, because if somebody that is a smart person can understand what you want to do and why at a at a high level they probably th that those reviewers probably really will get it because they know uh, the field and so it's it's really important to make things uh, um easy to absorb so that you know that threshold for an excellent rating is uh, um, not as hard <laughs> I think that's uh, that's great advice. Um, and I'll say from a personal standpoint, definitely, I think being a reviewer, but also talking to your colleagues who've had successful proposals and 
get copies of those. Most people are mm -hmm. more than happy to share. And if they're not, just send an email to someone else and the second person probably will be. And I, I think that that can be really, really helpful, especially when you're first starting out to figure that out. So I think we're just about out of time. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Giovanna and and Dan for for doing this. I think it's a really uh, great service to the the U Sugar community, also the broader audience who is able to join us today. And uh, Giovanna, if you want to remind people one more time of what to put in their email subject line, uh, so <laughs> yeah. you don't miss those. Um, absolutely, I think that would be really a good idea. I've been just swamped in the last two months so apologies um if you just uh, put in the jail congress meeting in the subject line that will kind of uh help uh, quite a lot and uh, looking forward to seeing all of you <laughs> yeah can't wait sorry we'll miss you dan but uh, it's yeah. gonna be a good time in vancouver Great job, Jack. Great job, Giovanna and Dan. Thank you guys for doing this every year. We really appreciate it. And I like doing it this way, where you guys get to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations at the conference instead of doing this out there. And then, uh, you know, I, I feel like it's a better use of everybody's time. I think a couple of things I wanted to add, we, we ran a couple of polls in the chat during the uh, stream. And one is uh, about 50% of our audience, at least those people who voted, have never received an NSF award, um, which is good. Maybe we're going to get some new PIs out of this. But I would say don't be afraid. Um, it, it varies a lot. I, I know Giovanna and Dan, you guys have probably seen this by discipline, right? The amount of proposals that people put in. I always felt like computer science got absolutely bombarded with stuff. Because people would hear, oh, 10% success rate, better put in 10 proposals. Other directorates don't see that, but you should never be afraid to write a proposal. The worst thing that's going to happen is that your program manager is going to work with you to try to make it better because it doesn't get uh, funded. That's that's like the absolute worst thing that could happen. I, I also will put just some point out that there was a there was a number mentioned and we are not allowed to say what success rate is other than the slide that I showed first. And I'll say that is not the number. I've spent a lot of time in advisory committee meetings in, uh, in my life. I got inside info. Um, I just want to say, you know, I'm never I've never said that is the, the number. <laughs> The other thing I want to mention, I put another one in there about what people think about the increasing move to interdisciplinary research. And for a long time, I do feel like there were disciplines that resisted this. And I think geotech is kind of out of that woods now, thankfully. Embrace interdisciplinary in interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinary research. Go meet your colleagues around campus. Come up with creative stuff. Um, at, at, Again, nothing bad can happen from this. And to talk to you guys, to, to reach out to your program managers and directors, have those conversations. That's what they're there for. I know when I was a grad student, I really didn't understand how to do that and whether I should do it and what the benefit would be to me. And, you know, it takes a long time sometimes for people to not be afraid and, and to reach out and have those conversations. So that's all I wanted to add. But thanks to the three of you for doing this today. Again, we'll add, if you don't know anything about you, Sugar, and like Jack said, that's probably not a lot of you, we'll put, actually, it's down in the notes below the window where you're watching this now. You can just click on that link, go to the you Sugar website and find out all kinds of information. Same thing goes for the Geo Institute. If you don't know anything, spend some time on the site, get to know us a little bit better. So, Giovanna and Dan, thank you again for doing this today. It was really helpful. I think it was fun. We got some good questions. And for all of our viewers, our next live stream is going to be exactly one week from today. It'll be Geostrata Extra for the February-March issue. We'll have Tuche Bashar, Sissy Nicolau, and Osgun Numanoglu talking about their piece in the current issue about the 2023 Turkey and Syria earthquakes. So you'll want to be around for that. You can register for free on Eventbrite as always. So we hope to see you next week. Everybody have a great Valentine's Day and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.